the translation of the Old Testament out of the Hebrew into Greek. All right, we're continuing with the translators to the readers. While God would be known only in Jacob and have his name great in Israel and in none other place, while the dew lay on Gideon's fleece only and all the earth besides was dry, then for one and the same people, which spake all of them the language of Canaan, that is Hebrew, one and the same original in Hebrew was sufficient. But when the fullness of time drew near, and the Son of Righteousness, the Son of God, should come into the world, whom God ordained to be reconciliation through faith in his blood, not of the Jew only, but also of the Greek, yea, of all them that were scattered abroad, then, lo, it pleased the Lord to stir up the spirit of, the, of a Greek prince, Greek for descent and language, even of Ptolemy Philadelph, king of Egypt, to procure the translating of the book of God out of Hebrew into Greek. This is the translation of the 70 interpreters commonly so called which prepared the way for our Savior among the Gentiles by written preaching as St. John Baptist did among the Jews by vocal. For the Grecians being desirous of learning were not wont to suffer books of worth to lie molding in king's libraries but had many of their servants ready ready scribes to copy them out and so they were dispersed and made common again the Greek tongue was well known and made familiar to most inhabitants in Asia by reason of the conquest that there the Grecians had made as also by the colonies which thither they had sent for the same causes also it was well understood in many places of Europe yea and of Africa too therefore the world of the word of God being set forth in Greek becometh hereby like a candle set upon a candlestick which giveth light to all that are in the house or like a proclamation sounded forth in the marketplace which most men presently take knowledge of and therefore that language was fittest to contain the scriptures both for the first preachers of the gospel to appeal unto for witness and for the learners also of those times to make search and trial by it is certain that the translation was not so found and so perfect but that but that it needed in many places places correction and who had been so sufficient for this work as the apostles or ap apostolic men yet it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to them to take that which they found the same being for the greatest part true and sufficient rather than by making a new in that new world and green age of the church to expose themselves to many exceptions and cavillations as though they made a translation to serve their own turn and therefore bearing witness to themselves their witness not to be regarded this may be supposed to be some cause why the translation of the 70 was allowed to pass for current notwithstanding though it was commended generally yet it did not fully content the learned no not of the Jews for not long after Christ, Achilla fell in hand with a new translation, and after him Theodotion, and after him Symmachus, yea, there was a first and fixed edition, the authors whereof were not known. These with the seventy made up the hexapla, and were worthily and to great purpose compiled together by Origen. 
Howbeit the addition of the 70 went away with the credit, and therefore not only was placed in the midst by origin, for the worth and excellency thereof above the rest, as Epaphanius gathereth, but also was used by the Greek fathers for the ground and foundation of their commentaries. <coughs> Yea, Epiphanius above named doth attribute so much unto it that he holdeth the authors thereof not only for interpreters, but also for prophets in some respect. And Justinian, the emperor, enjoined the Jews, his subjects, to use specially the translation of the seventy, rendereth this reason thereof. Because they were, as it were, enlightened with prophetical grace, yet for all that, as the Egyptians are said, of the prophet to be men and not God, and their horses flesh and not spirit, so it is evident, and St. Hierome affirmeth as much, that the seventy were interpreters, they were not prophets, they did many things well as learned men, but as yet but yet as men they stumbled and fell, one while through oversight, another while through ignorance, yea, sometimes they may, may be noted to add to the original, and sometimes to take from it, which made the apostles to leave them many times, when they left the Hebrew, and to deliver the sense thereof, according to the truth of the word, as the Spirit gave them utterance. This may suffice touching the Greek translations of the Old Testament. <coughs> there were also within a few hundred years after Christ translations many into the Latin tongue. For this tongue also was very fit to convey the law and the gospel by... Because in those, those times, very many countries of the west, yea, of the south, east, and north, spake, to, uh, spake or understood Latin, being made provinces to the Romans. But now the Latin translations were too many to be all good, for they were infinite. <coughs> Again, they were not out of the Hebrew fountain, we speak of the Latin translations of the Old, Old Testament, but out of the Greek stream. Therefore, the Greeks being not altogether clear, the Latin derived, let's see, this is translation out of Hebrew and Greek into Latin. <coughs> okay, so therefore the Greek being not altogether clear, the Latin derived from it, must needs be muddy. This moves St. Hierome, probably Jerome, a most learned father and best linguist without controversy of his age or of any that went before him to undertake the translating of the Old Testament out of the very fountains themselves which he performed with the evidence of great learning judgment, industry, and faithfulness that he had forever bound the church unto him in a debt of special remembrance and thankfulness. Okay, the translating of the scripture into the vulgar tongues. <coughs> now, uh, though the church were thus furnished with Greek and Latin translations, even before the faith of Christ was generally embraced in the empire, for the learned know that even in St. Hierome's time, the consul of Rome and his wife were both ethnics, and about the same time the greatest part of the Senate also. <coughs> yet for all the godly learned, for, uh, yet for all that the godly learned were not content to have the scriptures in the language which themselves understood, Greek and Latin as the good lepers were not content to tear well themselves, but acquainted their neighbors with the store that God had said, sent, and they also might provide for themselves. 
but also for the behoof and edifying of the unlearned, which hungered and thirsted after righteousness, and had souls to be saved as well as they, they provided translations into the vulgar for their countrymen, insomuch that most nations under heaven did shortly after their conversion hear Christ speaking unto them in their mother tongue. <coughs> Not by the voice of their minister only, but also by the written word translated. If any doubt hereof, he may be satisfied by examples enough, if enough will serve the turn. First, St. Hierome saith, <coughs> The scripture being translated before in the language of many nations doth show that those things that were added by Lucian and Hesychius are false. So St. Hierome in that place, the same Hierome elsewhere affirmeth that he, the time was, had set forth the translation of the seventy. For his countrymen of Dalmatia, which words not only Erasmus doth understand to purport, that St. Hierome translated the scripture into the Dalmatian tongue, but also Sixtus Senephus and Alphonsus de Castro, that we speak of no more, men not to be accepted against by them of Rome, do ingeniously confess as much. So St. Chrysostom, that lived in St. Hierome's time, Giveth evidence, giveth evidence with him. The doctrines of St. John, saith he, did not in such short, as the philosophers did, vanish away, but the Syrians, Egyptians, Indians, Persians, Ethiopians, and infinite other nations, being barbarous people, translated it into their mother tongue, and have learned to be true philosophers." he meaneth Christians. To this may be added, Theodoret, as next unto him, both for antiquity and for learning. His words be these, Every country that is under the sun is full of these words, of the apostles and prophets, and the Hebrew tongue, he meaneth the scriptures in the Hebrew tongue, is turned not only into the language of the Grecians, but also of the Romans, and Egyptians, and Persians, and Indians, and Armenians, and Scythians, and Soromatians, and briefly into all the languages that any nation useth. So he, in like manner, <coughs> Apillus is reported by Paulus Diaconus, and, Is and Isidore, and before them by Sozomen, to have translated the scriptures into the Gothic tongue. John Bishop of Seal by Vassius, to have turned them into Arabic, about the year of our Lord, 717. Beda by Sister Tiensis, to have turned a great part of them into Saxon. Ephnard by Trithemus, to have abridged the French Psalter, as Beda had done the Hebrew, about the year 800. King Alurid, <coughs> by the said Sister Tiensis, to have turned the Psalter into Saxon. Methodius by Aventinus, Printed at Ingolstead to have turned the scriptures into Scloonian, Valdo, Bishop of Frising, by Butus Renanus, to have caused about that time the Gospels to be translated into Dutch rhythm, yet extent in the library of Corbinian Valdus. 
by divers to have turned them himself or to have gotten them turned into French. About the year 1160, Charles V of that name surnamed the wife to have caused them to be turned into French about 200 years after Valdus his time, of which translation there be many copies yet extant. As witnesseth Barrow Aldus, much about that time, even in our King Richard the Second's days, John Trevola translated them into English, and many English Bibles in written hand are yet to be seen with diverse, translated as it is very probable in that age. So the Syrian translation of the New Testament is in most learned men's libraries. Of Widman Stadius, his setting forth, and the Psalter in Arabic is with many. Of Augustinius Nebiensis setting forth, so Postel affirmeth that in his travail he saw the Gospels in the Ethiopian tongue. And Ambrose Theseus alleged the Psalter of the Indians, which he testifieth to have been set forth by Potkin in Syrian characters, so that to have the scriptures in the mother tongue is not a quaint conceit lately taken up, either by the Lord Cromwell in England, or by the Lord Radeville in Polony, or by the Lord Ungnadius, Un in the emperor's dominion, but hath been thought upon and put in practice of old, even from the first times of the conversion of any nation, no doubt because it was esteemed most profitable to cause faith to grow in men's hearts the sooner, and to make them to be able to say with the words of the psalm, as we have heard, so have we seen. Now, the Church of Rome, let me see if I missed anything here. The unwillingness of our chief adversaries that the scriptures should be divulged in the mother tongue. <coughs> uh, Greek. Now the Church of Rome would seem at the length to bear a motherly affection towards her children and to allow them the scriptures in their mother tongue. But indeed it is a gift, not deserving to be called a gift, an unprofitable gift. They must first get a license in writing before they may use them. And to get that they must approve themselves to the confessor, that is to be such as are if not frozen in the dregs, yet soured with the leaven of their superstition. Howbeit it seemed too much to Clement the Eight that there should be any license granted, granted to have them in the vulgar tongue, and therefore he overruleth and frustrateth the grant of Pius the Fourth. So much are they afraid of the light of the scriptures, scripture. Lucifuge scriptarium as Tertullian speaketh. Lucifuge scriptarium, light of the scripture, that they will not trust the people with it, no, not as it is set forth by their own sworn men, no, not with the license of their own bishops and inquisitors, yea, so unwilling they are to communicate the scriptures to the people understanding in any sort that they are not ashamed to confess that we force them to translate it into English against their wills. This seemeth to argue a bad cause or a bad conscience or both. Sure, we are. That it is not he that hath good gold, that is, afraid to bring it to the touchstone, but he that hath the counterfeit. Neither is it the true man that shunneth the light, 
but the malefactor left his deeds should lest his deeds should be reproved neither is it the plain dealing merchant that is unwilling to have the weights or the metured brought in place but he that useth deceit but we will let them alone for this fault and return to translation see the observation set forth by clement his authority upon the fourth rule of Pieth, the fourth his making in the index the speeches and reasons both of our brethren and of our adversaries against this work many men's mouths have been open a good while and yet are not stopped with speeches about the translation so long in hand or rather perusals of translations made before and ask what may be the reason what the necessity of the employment hath the church been deceived say they all this while hath her sweet bread been mingled with leaven her silver with dross her wine with water her milk with lime we hope that we had um we hope that we had been in the right way that we had had the oracles of god delivered unto us and that through all the world had caused had cause to be offended and to complain yet that we had none hath the nurse holden out the breast and nothing but wind in it hath the bread been delivered by the fathers of the church and the same proved to be lapidosis as seneca speaketh if anybody wants to go over the things in other languages in the margins and parentheses you could do that in the comments under the video hath the bread been delivered by the fathers of the church and the same proved to be lapidosis at Sene as seneca speaketh what is it to handle the word of god deceitfully if this be not the certain brethren also adversaries of judah and jerusalem or jerusalem like sam ballot in nehemiah mock as we hear both at the work and workmen saying what do these weak jews will they make the stones whole again out of the heaps of dust are burnt although they build yet if a fox go up he shall even break down their stony wall was their translation good before why do they now mend it was it not good why then was it obtruded to the people yea why did the catholics meaning popish romanists always go in jeopardy for refusing to go to hear it nay if it must be translated into english catholics are fittest to do it they have learning and they know when a thing is well we will answer them both briefly and the former being brethren thus with saint hierome that is do we condemn the ancient in no case but after the endeavors of them that were before us we take the best pains we can in the house of god as if he said being provoked by the example of the learned that lived before my time i have thought it my duty to assay whether my talent in the knowledge of the tongues may be profitable in any measure to god's church lest i should seem to have labored in them in vain and lest i should be thought to glory in man, men although ancient above that which was in them thus saint high rome may be thought to speak a satisfaction to our brethren and to the same effect say we 
that we are so far off from condemning any of their labors that travail before us in this kind, either in this land or beyond sea, either in King Henry's time or King Edward's, if there were any translation or correction of a translation in his time, or Queen Elizabeth of ever-renowned memory, that we acknowledge them to have been raised up of God for the building and furnishing of his church, and that they deserve to be had of us and of posterity in everlasting remembrance. The judgment of Aristotle is worthy and well known. If Timotheus had not been, we had not had much sweet music, but if Phrynus, Timotheus his master, had not been, we had not had Timotheus. Therefore, blessed be they, and most honored be their name, that break the yoke, and giveth onset upon that which helpeth forward to the saving of souls. Now what can be more available thereto than to deliver God's book unto God's people in a tongue which they understand? Since of an hidden treasure and of a fountain that is sealed there is no profit, as Ptolemy Philadelph wrote in the Rabbins or Masters of the Jews, as witnesseth Epiphanius, Epiphanius, and as St. Augustine saith, a man had rather be with his dog than with his stranger, whose tongue is strange unto him. Yet for all that is, as nothing is begun and profited at the same time, and the later thoughts are thought to be wiser, if we build upon their foundation that went before us, and being helping by their labors, do endeavor to make that better which they left so good. No man, we are sure, hath cause to mislike us. They, we persuade ourselves, if they were alive, would thank us. The vintage of Abiezer that strake the stroke, yet the gleaning of grapes of Ephraim was not to be despised. See Judges 8, verses 2. Iosh, the king of Israel, did not satisfy himself till he had smitten the ground three times, and yet he offended the prophet for giving over then. Achilla, of whom we spake before, <coughs> translated the Bible as carefully and as skillfully as he could, and yet he thought good to go over it again, and then it got the credit with the Jews to be called that is accurately done, accurately done. As St. Hierome witnesses, how many books of profane learning have been gone over again and again by the same translators by others. Of one and the same books as Aristotle's Ethics, there are extent not so few as six or seven several translations. Now if this cost may be bestowed upon the good, which affordeth us a little shade of the gourd, which affordeth us a little shade, and which today flourisheth, but tomorrow is cut down. What may we bestow? Nay, that we, that what ought we not to bestow upon the vine, the fruit whereof maketh glad the conscience of man, and the stem whereof abideth forever. And this is the word of God, which we translate. What is the chafe to the wheat, saith the Lord? saith uh, Tertullian. If a toy of glass be of that reckoning with us, how ought we to value the true pearl? Therefore let no man's eye be evil, because his majesty's is good. Neither let any be grieved that we have a prince 
that seeketh the increase of the spiritual wealth of Israel. Let Samballots and Tobias do so, which therefore do bear their just reproof. But let us rather bless God from the ground of our heart for work in this religious care in him, to have the translations of the Bible maturely considered of and examined. For by this means it committeth to pass that whatsoever is found already, and all his sound for substance, in one or other of our editions, and the worst of ours fare better than their authentic vulgar. The same will shine as gold more brightly, being rubbed and polished also, if anything be halting or superfluous, or not so agreeable to the original. The same may be corrected, and the truth set in place." And what can the king command to be done that will bring him more true honor than this? And wherein could they have been set a work, approve their duties to the king, yea, their obedience to God, and love to his saints more than by yielding their service and all that is within them for the furnishing of the work? But besides all this, they were the principal motives of it, and therefore ought left to quarrel it. For the very historical truth is, that upon the importunate petitions of the Puritans, at His Majesty's coming to the crown, the conference at Hampton Court, having been appointed for hearing their complaints, when by force of reason they were put from all other grounds, they had recourse at the last to this shift that they could not with good conscience subscribe to the com communion book. Since it maintained the Bible as it was there translated, which was, as they said, a most corrupted translation. And although this was judged to be but a very poor and empty shift, yet even hereupon did His Majesty begin to bethink himself of the good that might ensue by a new translation, and presently after gave the order for this translation, which is now presented unto thee, thus much to satisfy our scrupulous brethren. To be continued in the next video.